Hello everyone, welcome to the ninth lecture in MEC 3430, Automotive Engineering Fundamentals. In this lecture, we're gonna continue on with our looking at the other mechanical components in the vehicle, and we're gonna look at the steering systems that are typical in automotive engineering or in automotive vehicles. Looked at in Lex, last lecture, the suspension, we looked at suspension basics, we looked at wheel alignment, and we looked at suspension systems. Uh, we did say, though, that this was only an introduction and that most of the design aspects of suspension systems will be covered in vehicle dynamics. So in this class, we're going to look at steering system basics. We're going to look at steering, typical steering systems. And then we're going to look at the phenomenon of over slash understeer. Okay, common steering linkage arrangements. So what are these linkage arrangements? What is their design purpose? Well, it's designed to give driver continuous control over vehicle path. Um, it is highly dependent on the suspension and the chassis choice. Now, there are three main linkage designs, the axle beam steering linkage, the split track rod steering linkage, and the rack and pinion steering linkage. These are three options for automotive vehicle design. So what is the idea behind a steering system? Well, there's some fundamentals. The first is the steering wheel free play. This is the distance the wheel can turn under light pressure before encountering resistance. Uh, this means if you could turn the steering wheel without feeling any resistance from the steering system. Now, ideally, you don't want any of this. You don't want to be able to be able to turn your wheel without any resistance. In other words, not a lot of feedback between the steering wheel inputs and what is actually happening on the road. Um, if you look at Volkswagen Beetles from the 1960s, if you're on the highway driving at a 100 kilometers or more, you could turn the steering wheel almost a full quarter rotation or almost a half rotation and you would not turn. Uh, that is terrible, terrible free play. Um, so generally you don't want any of it. Then there's the, another important factor called the steering ratio. So it's the number of degrees of rotation a steering wheel must move in order to move the road wheels one degree. So in this case, this diagram here, we see we turn the steering wheel 30 degrees, but the wheel is actually only rotated about one degree. Uh, this is a 30 to one steering ratio. Why do we have steering ratios? Well, because we need a mechanical advantage to be able to turn the wheels. Um, trying to turn the wheel at a one to one ratio, unless you're the Hulk, and even if you were the Hulk, you wouldn't be able to do it. It just requires way too much force. So what do we do? We increase the force by having a steering ratio, which means we have to turn the wheel further for a given amount of steering or given amount of wheel rotation, but the advantage is we don't need as much force to do it. So basing steering system components, I am going to go over these basic components. Um, I'm going to let everyone else everyone go through these components at their own pace, similar to what we did with internal combustion engines. So please pause this video and read through these. And please pause the video again and read through these as well. Okay, so let's look through the three types of systems. Now, I'm gonna move through very quickly because uh, once I get to the rack and pinion, it will become clear why. So there's the axle beam steering linkage. Here's some more layouts of the different components. There is the split track rod steering linkage. And then there is the rack and pinion. Now, why did I go so quickly and go right to rack and pinion? Well, because the rack and pinion is by far the choice for automotive engineering design. Um, almost 99.9999% of all vehicles, including somewhat those that are in heavy duty diesel situations as well, are using a rack and pinion steering linkage. It's a fairly robust system. Um, it works very well for the intended application. And so those other two um, versions generally are not used much in automotive engineering at all. It's good to know they exist, but for all practical purpose, it's rack and pinion. Now, why is it called rack and pinion? Well, we have a rack. If we see this little GIF down here, down in the right corner, we have a rack that is connected to some sort of rigid member and connected to the wheels. And then we have a pinion. As the wheel is steering wheel is turned, the pinion rotates, which moves the rack back and forth, which therefore pivots the wheels back and forth in terms of rotation. So that's why it's called rack and pinion. The pinion 
rotates, moves the rack back and forth, and there that causes a steering action. You can see this also this other GIF here in terms of what happens in terms of how the connection between the rack and the wheels themselves. So common rack and pinions. Uh, steering wheel here is a pinion and here is a typical rack. Generally they are, um, the rack is a still a cylindrical type object to mesh with the pinion gear. Then we can also see here how it connects to the suspension system to allow for steering. Again, this is more details about the rack and pinion. I'm not overly concerned with the details here, but they are there for you to look at. And steering wheel configuration comparison. Well, I've already kind of discussed this. By far the most common is rack and pinion. In automotive engineering, essentially the other two are not to use. And so effectively the other two steering linkage systems are dead. Uh, this will similarly be to the internal combustion engine in 20 to 80 years. Now, as we discussed in the electric vehicle, I think it's gonna be a lot closer to 80 years. Although some people think by 2040, the internal combustion engine will be a completely dead. Okay, so we know we're always going to be using rack and pinion. Um, that's really the dominant design choice. And to my knowledge, there isn't anything else out there that is used. The other thing to consider with a steering system is the Ackerman principle. So initial attempts at, turn, tun, at turnable steering were crude and implemented a pivot at the vehicle's center line, which allowed the steering axle to rotate. So if we look at figure 8.7, Essentially, we had this pivot turntable. We could turn it, and that would turn the wheels. However, we ended up with an excessive tire scrub. Because, why do we have that? Well, because we know that the inside tire ends up going through a different path than the outside tire. It's going through a different circle. So true rolling conditions without tire scrub are created when the direction of motion is perpendicular to the wheel axis. We want to make sure that the direction of motion is always perpendicular to the wheel axis, i.e. it's turning around like it's going through a circle. So in order to accomplish true rolling, wheels must rotate around the instantaneous center. So if we look at the next slide, we can see this is based on the ability to rotate the steering wheels at different angles to allow for pure rolling with no scrub. So with the Ackerman principle, you can actually calculate the angles at which you have to have your two tires given the radius of the corner you are trying to navigate. And as you can see, the wheels are actually at different angles depending on the radius of the corner you're actually trying to make. So the point here is the Ackerman principle basically says is that the wheels that are steering should actually turn at different angles for a given radius of a corner. This allows for pure rolling with no scrub. So a rack and pinion system has to be designed to allow for this to occur. And you can actually calculate what the optimal angle is based on the Ackerman principle. Now, I'm not necessarily concerned with people being able to make the calculation with the Ackerman principle, but I, it is important to be aware that it exists. Okay, and the last thing that I wanted to talk about really was over and under steer. So what is neutral steer? We'll define neutral steer first, so then we can understand oversteer and understeer. So neutral steer, on a turn of constant radius, the steer angle required to negotiate the turn is equal to the Ackerman angle regardless of vehicle speed. So if we wanna go around a constant radius turn, the steering angle required to negotiate the turn corner is equal to that Ackerman angle regardless of the vehicle speed. What is understeer? On a turn of constant radius, the steer angle is proportional to K times the lateral acceleration. So we have to put in more steering the faster we are going. So this lateral acceleration causes the front wheels to slip at a greater rate than the rear wheels. This results in the front wheels breaking away from the road and the vehicle deviating from a turn into a straight path. So you turn the wheel, but you keep going straight. The vehicle is said to push through a corner. So understeer is you turn the wheel and the vehicle does not turn as you expect it to, it keeps going straight. And this phenomenon is worse the faster you are going. Oversteer, it's the opposite. On a turn of constant radius, the steering angle must decrease as speed increases. So this happens when the rear wheels experience slip at a greater rate than the front wheels. 
And this can be compensated for by turning the front wheels out of the turn to maintain turn radius, i.e. counter steering. Now, with a vehicle that has oversteer, the vehicle is said to be loose, i.e. the rear end likes to slide out, and it's said to be loose. Now, this is another way of looking at neutral under and oversteer. So oversteer, the steering angle must decrease as speed increases. So we look at oversteer, as you're going faster, the actual input steering angle has to be less and less and less to actually achieve the corner of the desired radius. Now eventually you hit a critical speed. This is the speed where no matter what steering input you give, you are going to oversteer, i.e. you're going way too fast to negotiate a corner of any radius. Then there is understeer here. This the steering angle must increase. In other words, a greater degree of turn to compensate for tire slip. Now eventually, once again, no matter how much input you give, you are not going to be able to negotiate the corner because of too much understeering. So in either way, speed is your enemy here. The, whether you're an oversteer vehicle or an understeer, if you are going too fast, you won't be able to negotiate the corner as expected. Now, here's a video that will be again posted to Blackboard that looks at oversteer versus understeer. Now, I think the technical content of this video is quite good um, in terms of how it describes oversteer, understeer, and how to avoid or correct both of them, or how you could induce them depending on your uh, desires. Um, please note the video is in somewhat of a humorous nature, and they are trying to be funny. Um, I believe this video should be watched for the technical content and not necessarily for the humor they are trying to do. Unfortunately, I could not find a better video. But again, I think the technical content of this video is quite strong and therefore it is worth watching. The difference is... Whoops, didn't want to start that there. Sorry about that. Okay, steering linkage alignment. Let's make sure I didn't skip anything. Yep, steering linkage alignment. So also you have to consider static tow must not only be considered with regards to vehicle thrust, but also steering angles. So as you're going to move your steering linkage, you're also going to be affecting tow. So you have to think about, well, how is the static tow going to be considered with steering angles as you want to be able to maintain your static tow even as you're turning or steering the vehicle. Now, as I said earlier, when we go to steer the vehicle, um, unless you're the Hulk, you're not going to have enough strength to be able to actually um, steer the vehicle without some sort of assistance. Most steering systems in almost all automotives use power steering, and it's a hydraulic power steering system. There are some that have electric assist, although this is not as common. By far, the most common is hydraulic power steering. Um, here are some details of the system. I'm more concerned with you understanding that power steering is common in most automotive vehicles. Now, here's a video about power steering. It's going to be from the uh, perspective of hydraulic power steering. This will again be posted to Blackboard, and I do suggest you watch it. Last topic, four-wheel steering. So, so far in this lecture, we've only been talking about steering the front wheels. Well, in some vehicles, although very rare, uh, the Dodge Stealth was one vehicle that had four-wheel steering, is that all four wheels will actually rotate. So the main advantage of four-wheel steer is reduction in turning radius. This is actually very common in forklifts, where we actually have all the wheels be able to turn. So there are three main methods for doing four-wheel steering. So there's opposite phase operation. This is where the rear wheels steer in opposite direction of the front. This is what's done when you're going under 30 miles per hour. We have the same phase operation where the rear wheels steer in the same direction as the front. Generally, you want to do this when you're going over 30 miles per hour. And then there's phase reverse operation. Rear wheels first steer in the opposite direction as front wheels then in the same direction, i.e. depends on vehicle speed. So someone who manufactures a vehicle with four wheel steering, you can choose it to always be opposite or counter phase steering, always same phase, or have some intelligent logic where at low speeds it's counter phase and at high speeds it's in phase. Again, very few production vehicles have implemented four wheel steering, mainly because it's not worth it. Um, to be able to re reduce your turning radius at most common vehicle speeds, the, reducing the turning radius is not your limiting factor to negotiating a corner. It's the grip between your tires and the road. 
So being able to reduce your turning radius, well, it doesn't matter if your vehicle, if your tires cannot generate enough grip to be able to negotiate that corner at that radius. So for most practical purposes, four-wheel steering is not useful at all. Now, if you have a fork truck that's generally going low speed around a plant, being able to turn quickly in a small radius is very beneficial. And you're not going very fast, you're going very slow. So that makes more sense. But for most vehicle applications, four-wheel steering, it's a gimmick rather than actually being useful. So ticket out the door, something you learned today, something where the explanation was not clear or it was confusing. All right, thank you very much for watching this lecture, and I'll see you next time for a lecture on brakes, body, and chassis.